What's going on, perfumery peeps? Uh, it's been a minute. It's been a while since I posted a video. Uh, I've been very, very busy. And I think for this video, I'm gonna probably uh, walk you through a, a current fragrance that I'm working on and not so much share the formula, but this video is more geared towards what goes on in my mindset when I'm building a fragrance, why do I choose certain materials over the others? Uh, why do I go through many, many trials in different batches, trying to experiment with different ratios, different materials, trying to convey or uh, envision what I had thought, uh, what I wanted to smell like, and just really try to get it to come to life on how I envisioned this fragrance to smell. So, to give you some uh, back context, uh, what I am working on right now is a, it's kind of a unisex fragrance, definitely a summertime fragrance, uh, something easy breezy, slightly aquatic, uh, definitely tropical nuanced, uh, but very clean and something very easy for anyone to wear. But I am trying to take it so it could be unisex but i'm leaning it a bit more to the masculine side based on certain materials that i chose and the ratios and i'll walk you through everything in here uh what materials i'm using why i chose those materials what its role and function is in this uh fragrance composition and the way that everything sits right now i'm currently on batch trial number 22 which to me is not very, it's, that's not a lot of uh, trial batches. Usually I like to go up to almost like maybe 50 trial batches. But this one on trial batch 22 is sitting pretty balanced and pretty nice, uh, in my opinion. So it's something worth talking about of all these different materials that I'm putting into it at, uh, you know, rough ratios and, and dosings to give you an idea of, you know, why I chose these materials, what's going on in my thought, thought process, uh, how do certain materials kind of play together to form accords and how everything just kind of works holistically to give you the end result that I'm trying to achieve, which is, you know, again, a unisex fragrance that's summer, tropical, maybe slightly gourmand, but not really. But I wanted some elements of, you know, aromatics and things like that, a little bit of citruses in the top. So without further ado, let's just basically start. And I may jump around a little bit, but I want to talk about uh, some of my uh, some of the base notes first, some of the the longer lasting materials, and specifically the musk and the musk choices that I chose uh, and why I'm choosing these uh, specific musks. So, in this batch or this fragrance, I am definitely relying on cashmeran, and to me, cashmeran is very multifaceted, uh, definitely pillowy textured, but it has nuances of maybe some aromatics, like a little bit of pine undertones to it, but mostly it's there for a textured feel. Now, usually when I use cashmeran, I tend to dose it very low in a formula because I wanna use it as a nuance. But in this fragrance, I'm actually dosing it a little higher than normal because I do want the cashmeran to come out and really pop in this fragrance to I want it to be easily detectable. So I start with cashmeran, and in this formulation, I'm roughly at about 1.2% cashmeran. Now moving on to the musk, I specifically chose, uh, I'm just sticking with three musks in this. I went with helvetolide, habanolide, and mucinone. And the reason why I chose these three musks was, to me, habanolide uh, has this very, uh, discreet white, you know, clean musk, but with a linen-like texture to it. And when I think summer tropical, I'm always thinking, you know, the Habana guy that's wearing the white linen shirt, maybe with like a cabana hat or something. So I knew I wanted to use Habanolide in this, but I also wanted to combo it with Helvetolide because Helvetolide has a, a slightly fruity top note appearance. So the... 
Helvetilide in this is roughly at about four and a half percent, but the habanilide in this is about 9.5 percent. Now, that is what I'm. I'm using these two as the workhorse of the the musks uh, to you know to give not only just fixation, but it accompanies the overall theme of what I'm trying to do. But then I microdosed uh, mucinone because to me mucinone is very. It's very musky in a sense of a, a brown kind of overtone. It's very animalic. It's very uh, almost like a nitro musk, like an old school nitro musk, but it's still a modern, you know, clean musk. But I'm microdosing this uh, mucinone at only four parts per thousand because I don't want the mucinone to become apparent in the blend, but it's there to support havetalide and habanalide just to give it a slight tinge of what I call brown coloring uh, to the scent because both helvetilide and habanilide are typically considered, you know, classic white musk. When you microdose things like mucinone or muscone or anything like that in such small amounts, it just gives it a nice character. And to me also, mucinone does lean more masculine. So that's why I actually chose to do this uh, with those musks. Now, moving on to... Uh, some of the, what I consider the woody ambers, uh, because you can't really have a modern fragrance without some sort of woody ambers, you know, whether if you love them or hate them, you know, they always play an important role in my opinion. So I chose specifically uh, to do three woody ambers. Uh, one is called Z11 HD from Furmanich, and this is different than the regular Z11. Z11 HD came out of Captive, I believe, a little over a year ago. And to me, it smells similar to Z11, which is, you know, a typical woody amber profile uh, with musky nuances. But the HD variety is much cleaner and much more almost like a has a sheen to it, which I really enjoy. So I got Z11 HD uh, accompanied with... Uh, Dextramber from Takasago. Dext uh, Dextramber is the same thing as nor uh, norlimbinol. Ugh, I can't even say it. Norlimbinol dextro from Furmanich. It's just a different uh, manufacturer. So we can just say it's uh, nor norlimbinol dextro. And then I'm also using operanide from IFF. And operanide is a newly released uh, captive. And I've tested it in this fragrance because. And it's actually staying in this formulation because as I talk about other, uh, the other materials, you'll see why I chose uh, certain things. So Z11 HD, uh, again, these are super, super strong woody amber. So my Z11 HD is roughly just sitting under one, per, uh, one part per thousand. It's actually like a 0.7% of the overall concentrate. Now the dext uh, dextramber, or you can just say it's nor norlimbinol uh, dextro, uh, that one I have sitting at uh, six parts per thousand because it's it's to me it's a pretty strong woody amber, but I don't want to take it too high at the one percent level because then it just takes over. Because when you combo that with these uh, super what I call super woody ambers like the Z11 HD and Operanide, uh, the three combined fills out a nice woody amber accord, which doesn't really show its face until the late stages of the dry down because I didn't dose it too high. So they never really get in the way of the fragrance until the very later stages of the dry down. Now, Operanide from IFF. The reason why I chose Operanide because most woody ambers to me are very sharp in nature. Like when you smell them, they, they're very, not to say offensive, but they're very, very sharp in nature. They're piercing, they're dry. Opernide, uh, to me, smells a little bit more subdued, a little bit softer, with a nice uh, wet, mossy undertone. And I wanted to use this because I'm also going to be using some other mossy materials because when you're thinking of a fragrance that has a beachy aquatic feel, a lot of times perfumers will use either oak moss or vera moss or Evernil because oak moss can give you that impression of kind of like sea, sea moss, sea urchin, um, 
what's another thing? It, sometimes they say it has a nuance of like sea kelp or things like that. Uh, moist greenness will give you that sea impression. So opronide was an obvious choice for me. Now moving right along, uh, let's see. I'm using a, a small, small micro doses of some vanillin materials, um, like uh, just your classics, like vanillin, ethyl vanillin. Uh, those are parked at usually like well below one part per thousand because I don't want them to be smelled and give off a vanillic note. I want them just to support some sort of sweetness, basically, without actually smelling sweet. So I've got a little bit of uh, ethyl vanillin vanillin, which is roughly combined at uh, 0.3%. So that's well below one, one part per thousand. And then I'm also using isobutavan uh, with it, again, at 0.3%. So again, well below one, point, or one part per thousand, just to give it a little bit of sweetness into the underlying tone of the fragrance. Now... Moving on to the woods. So with this fragrance, I specifically wanted the woods and the wood accords to be the main theme uh, of this fragrance, along with, you know, obviously nuances of tropicals and fruits and, and citruses. But the woods, to me, I wanted to be the star player. And I specifically wanted uh, sandalwood. And then uh, accompany, it, uh, accompany it, yeah, I think I said that right, with uh, some other wood choices just to give the sandalwood some character. So my sandalwood accord is essentially just uh, fir santal from Firminich, poly santal, and javanol. And looking at my sheet here, I'm not going too crazy. Uh, fir santal is roughly eight parts per thousand. Uh, poly Santal, I'm just a little above 2% of the overall fragrance uh, concentrate. So 2% of Poly Santal, for some people that might be too high, but I find Poly Santal is a pretty tame subdued. So you can go up to 2% as a good sandalwood note. But when you use Poly Santal with Fir Santal, it takes a nice shape of its own into a good accord. And then of course, like I said, I use uh, also Javanol because what I found is for Santal and Poly Santal, while it is a base note, Javanol will outlast those materials easily. So I'm microdosing Javanol uh, at 0.6% uh, of the concentrate. So under one point or one point per thousand uh, in the overall fragrance for Javanol, which doesn't seem like a lot, but in the late stages of the dry down, again, once the uh, for Santal and Poly Santal are starting to become tame, the Javanol is still there going strong to kind of drag this all the way to the end of the, uh, the lifespan of the fragrance. So you're always going to get some sort of sandalwood scent from, you know, the beginning blast all the way to the end stages of the dry down. Uh, moving on now to what I did to make this so it's not just a, you know, sandalwood fragrance. I wanted to add a little bit of elements of other woody uh, nuances. I thought about doing, obviously, like patchouli, but patchouli, in my opinion, is just so, not to say it's overused, but it's it's become such a crutch for a lot of perfumers. Uh, so I was like, I'm not going to do patchouli in this one. I'm going to do vetiver. And I uh, specifically chose uh, Firminich makes vetiver SFE, which is just fancy name for vetiver CO2 extract. And to me, it's a lot more, not to say drier, but it is a cleaner vetiver. And when you dose it really low, like I did in this, uh, where is this here? My vetiver, I'm only doing seven parts per thousand. So in contrast, when you look at, you know, the 2% uh, polysantol, you know, the first santol was at eight parts per thousand. The vetiver is just roughly under that at seven parts per thousand, just to give the sandalwood some character. So it's not a one trick pony, you know, wood accord, basically. Um, and then the final woody uh, facet in here is good old fashioned said ramber. Uh, and this basically smells like, you know, cedar wood with a little bit of undertone of like uh, ambergris. 
And for my Ced, uh, Ced ugh, I can't even talk, Ced Ramber is at about 2.3% of the concentrate. So you can see there's a lot of woodsiness going on. Uh, we're looking at, you know, almost 6 to 7% of the whole overall concentrate of the fragrance is dedicated just to woodsiness. Now, moving on to some of the mossy materials that I wanted to talk about. And I'm keeping it simple. Obviously, Opernide was a, a small player just to because it has a mossy undertone. But I wanted to use uh, Evernil. Evernil is always used uh, for like if you want a cheap synthetic to give a like a oak moss like feel. Evernil, perfect, and it's super super long lasting. But I don't want this mossy accord to dominate the fragrance because it's more to be a supporting underlying role to give a feel or an impression of a beachiness, kind of like the sea kelp, the, the moist greenness without it coming off as oak moss. Like a, I don't want oak moss to be as a, a strong note in this. I just want to give it enough to give it a feel. So my Evernil, I am looking at under one part per thousand and the next material is real oak moss absolute which to me when you combo Evernil with real oak moss it's that's where the magic happens but because oak moss or real oak moss absolute is heavily restricted uh, with IFRA uh, I am looking at one part per thousand of real oak moss absolute so again the two combined we're looking at about two parts per thousand for the mossy accord but two parts per thousand with all these other things that we're going to talk about, it plays an underlying role that's not invasive. It's not dominant at all. Uh, moving on to Ambroxan. Now, Ambroxan, to me, you can't really do a good summer beachy fragrance without some sort of Ambrox or Ambrox derivative, whether if it's Ambrox Super, Ambrofix, Ambroxan, you know, Cetalox, they all come in many names. I'm just going to say this is Ambroxan. And Ambroxan in this uh, formulation, I'm actually going a little higher than I probably should. Uh, uh, the 5% of the fragrance concentrate is going to be from Ambro Ambroxan. But it gives the overall theme what I'm looking for when it comes to a, an animalic kind of ambergris synthetic -y smell kind of, so to speak. Now, moving on to, I hate to say the term fillers, because there's really no such thing as a filler when you're making a fragrance. The, like the next two materials to me kind of help dissipate things, because if you add a lot of strong materials, you need some weaker materials in there to help dissipate and spread things out, so to speak. Because if you don't use something that dissipates and spreads out your materials a little bit, it just becomes so cloying, so congested. And, you know, usually a lot of people are always reaching for like linalol, ethylinolol, linalol acetate, cornol, things like that. To me, those are nice, clean smelling materials that help kind of dissipate and thin things out in the mix to allow more room to put in some more potent materials. And so what I'm using in this is the first one, obviously, is Cornol. Uh, Cornol is pretty much the same thing as linalol, uh, but it's longer lasting. And it has a facet of coriander. So it has an herbal-like facet to it. But it's I use it like I would use the same thing as linalol. And I'm going pretty heavy in this fragrance. So Cornol and this fragrance is about four, almost four and a half percent is all Cornol. Now, the second one that I wanted to use in conjunction with Cornol is uh, Sclerolate. I think it's from IFF. Uh, I could be mistaken. But uh, Sclerolate is another form of like a linalol-like material, but... It has shades of clary sage. So, and this is one of the materials that I'm kind of using when I said earlier that I wanted the, the fragrance to be unisex, but I want it to lean ever so slightly more masculine. And that's why I chose to do uh, sclerolate because to me, clary sage is used heavily in a lot of men's fragrances for an 
herbal kind of aromatic top note. But with scler uh, sclerolate, though, it smells pretty much like linalol, and you don't necessarily get any sort of clary sage identifiable note from it. It just kind of hints at it ever so subtly. But what I found was the magic really happens when you combo sclerolate with linalol acetate. Because I know linalol acetate, even though a lot of people say, oh, it's found heavily in bergamot, it's found heavily in uh, lavender, but a lot, of pe a lot of people never mention that linalol acetate is found heavily in clary sage. Like a regular clary sage essential oil can make up 70, 75% of it is linalol acetate. So what I found was when you combine sclerolate with linalol acetate, it actually brings out the clary sage note a little bit without actually having to use clary sage essential oil. So I thought that was interesting. So with um, to backtrack, coronal, I said uh, was four and a half percent. Sclerolate, again, another high number. I'm going four and a half percent with this in the, in the concentrate. And then just a little bit of linalol acetate, uh, which is roughly one percent. Uh, these three combined helps spread out and thin the fragrance to allow me to now to add some more, more potent things. And then, of course, we're going to move on to Isoe Super and the Hedion family because in a modern fragrance, you can't have, you know, no Isoe Super, no Hedion. I mean, you could, but I mean, it's pretty far and few between that you don't find them in fragrances nowadays. So in this formulation... Uh, ISOE Super, I'm looking at uh, roughly a little above 17%. And I'm using a combination of Hedion with Hedion HC, uh, roughly equal proportions. And that is also, we're looking at about 23, a little shy over 23% uh, of my combined Hedions. Now we're going to move on to what I call the floral, uh, the floral accords, and um, so with this fragrance, because I did want to have it with a tropical nuance theme, I don't want to go heavy on the florals. I wanted the the woodiness, you know, the the sandal accord, the cedar amber vetiver to to be the main, you know, main. Uh, theme, so to speak, and I want the floral accord to sit under it. So what I'm trying to do, and I think I'm do, uh, doing pretty well, is I'm building a plumeria, or you can, some people call it frangipani, which is like a, a native flower from Hawaii. Uh, I'm building an accord of that with a few other floral type materials to help support it. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Liliol. Everybody knows of Liliol. It's such a, a staple in perfumery. It's a shame that it has been heavily restricted now. Uh, but in this, in this formulation that I've been up to now on trial number 22, I'm sticking with using Liliol because once I'm done finishing the fragrance, I can then rework the fragrance as a whole all over again, omit Liliol and replace it with other things to give it that same, you know, Liliol feel without actually using it. But for now, I'm just sticking with Liliol. And in this fragrance, it's a pretty good slug of Liliol. I'm looking at 4% Liliol. Now I'm also comboing Liliol with Ferminich's Lily Floral, li I'm sorry, Lily Floor. And to me, Lily Floor is not a Lyrol replacer by any means, but it is a very substantive and long lasting Lily type material. So by the time my 4% Lily all kind of fades away, the Lily Floor, which I'm dosing at about two parts per thousand, still drags it out into the very far reaches of the dry down. Um, now I'm using two iris, I would say irisy type materials, uh, but these two materials, I'm not trying to go for an iris note by any means. I just needed something soft textured and powdery uh, to go with this clean theme. So I'm going with Irelia Total from Ferminich and then just good old standard methyl ionone gamma. 
Now, I tried this formulation with just regular Irelia, which is heavier in the methyl ionone alpha. And it, when I used regular Irelia, it leaned the fragrance back to the feminine side for some reason. It was this, there's something bright about it that it just took it out of direction. Irelia Total has a more definite dry woodiness to it, which kind of helped, again, lean this unisex fragrance ever so slightly to the masculine side. So Irelia Total on this, I'm at about one and a half percent in the fragrance concentrate. Methyl Ionone Gamma, same, same dosage, one and a half percent. And now we are looking at, uh, we haven't gone into the Frangipani Accord just yet, but you can't do a good beachy fragrance with some sort of floral salicylate. And in this case, I'm just going with your run-of-the-mill benzyl salicylate, but I don't like the smell of it, so I'm keeping it low. Uh, benzyl salicylate, I'm roughly at about six parts per thousand, just a little shy under six parts per thousand. Now, going into the Frangipani, you know, Plumeria Accord, there is a perfumer uh, that goes on the Base Notes forum. Everybody knows him, Paul Kyler. He does make a great uh, Plumeria floral base. I think he calls it Plumeria Flower Power or something like that. To my nose, it's a great base to start a Plumeria Accord. Now, my girlfriend has two Plumeria trees in her backyard, so I keep going back to those trees as a reference point. And when I smell this Plumeria base, it does capture the kind of like heady, narcotic, exotic side to Plumeria. But the, the Plumeria trees that we have in our backyard are very, very rosy smelling. I mean, if you were to close your eyes and smell these flowers, the first thing you would probably think of is like, oh, that must be a rose. And then you'd open your eyes and be like, oh, that's not a rose, okay. They're that rosy smelling. So what I'm doing is I'm starting with small amounts of Paul Kyler's Plumeria base, and I'm adding some more rosy materials to help bring out the rosiness to match what I smell on our plumerias. So with the plumeria base, which by the way, you can get that at a uh, perfumer supply house. They, they stock it there. That's where I bought mine. The plumeria base, uh, I'm only using five parts per thousand. I'm keeping it low because I'm now adding other rosy materials like damascone alpha, geraniol, uh, phenoxenol, and a little bit of nerol. So obviously damascone alpha, everybody knows it, they use it. It's a good exalting agent. It's a little fruity, it's a little rosy, uh, but I'm keeping mine a little low. Just one part per thousand does the job for what I need. Now, when I smell our plumeria trees, I get a lot of geraniol out of our, uh, our trees. So I'm heavily dosing geraniol when I combine it with uh, Kyler's uh, Plumeria Flower Power base. So I'm using, uh, where am I? Three parts per thousand of the geraniol and then phenoxenol, which is just the synthetic kind of rose absolute. Instead of using real rose absolute, I'm going the El Cheapo route and phenoxenol to me smells almost like phenyl ethyl alcohol, PEA but much, much longer lasting because my earlier stages in this fragrance, I was uh, using PK's base with Damascone Alpha, Geraniol, and uh, PEA. But PEA is such a short-lived uh, floral note, and it kind of dissipates in the very early, right in between the top to the mid stages, it kind of fizzles away. I wanted to then, I, I tried Phenoxenol just because it has the same similarities as PEA but it's much longer lasting. And that I found works perfect for this. So we're looking at the, the floral cord for the frangipani that I'm, I'm going with is the plumeria cord from Paul Kyler's at five parts per thousand, geraniol, three parts per thousand, phenoxenol, uh, two parts per thousand. And then I'm just dosing in just a little bit of nerol 
at four parts per thousand because to me, Near All does have rosy qualities to it, but it also has a dewy kind of wet feel, which w does match the theme of the, uh, the beachy aquatic summertime fragrance. Uh, so we're gonna do four parts per thousand in Near All. Now, moving on to some green materials. Um, you can't have a fragrance without some sort of greenness because to me, something green just makes it more, more photorealistic. Uh, you can usually go to cis 3 hexanol Leafarome, Stemone, Trifernol. There's so many different green, grassy materials. But in this fragrance, I'm choosing to stick to cis 3 hexanol salicylate. So the reason for that, again, because it's going to be a, a beachy themed fragrance, salicylates play a good role with solar notes or solar flower uh, accords. But I needed to use this as a dual purpose. Uh, the cis 3 hexanol salicylate serves both as a salicylate floral, uh, like a solar kind of sunny flower, but also because it's based off of cis 3 hexanol, it has a greenness to it. So I'm getting a lot of greenness from this material. And cis 3 hexanol salicylate, I'm actually going quite high, in my opinion, at about 2.3% of the overall fragrance concentrate. The next uh, of the greenness I'm going to do is just micro dose a little bit of leafarome. And leafarome is another grassy material that has a slight fruity, almost like a banana undertone to it. There's definitely a fruitiness to it. And when I think banana, I think tropical. So I felt that this uh, grassy material would fit the theme perfectly because it serves a dual purpose. It's both green and fruity at the same time, but I'm dosing it so low. Uh, Leafarome is way below one part per thousand. It's at uh, 0.03%. So it's just a smidget trace of it. Really though, even in, it's such a strong material, even something that small of amount of Leafarome in a very clean, opaque fragrance, you'll notice it easily in the top notes. I mean, it just, boom, you get a flash of greenness and it gives a, a little bit of realism and naturalness, in my opinion. Now, moving on to my fruity accords. So you, you uh, when I say I wanted something tropical, you know, a tropical themed fragrance, I gotta have some tropical fruits. So I'm going to stick with just a few uh, key uh, uh, materials and then a couple of pre-made bases that I made myself. Now, the first one we're gonna uh, go with was uh, Paradisimide. And Paradisimide, I love it because it's one of those things that when it's in a fragrance, it never becomes too much. I mean, unless you're really dosing it high. It's one of those fragrances that always just kind of sits below everything, but every once in a while, you get this little spike in your nose of this sulfurous kind of tropical accord. And that's why I love Paradisimide. So in this fragrance, I've got it dosed at eight parts per thousand. I might take it up to 10 parts per thousand, which is 1% of the fragrance concentrate, but it's doing good at eight parts per thousand. It's doing exactly what I needed it to. Now, another part of the tropical fruity accord is another, I believe it's from Ferminich, it's called Oxiana Base. And Oxiana Base is just another bright, zesty, tropical, fruity kind of base that has grapefruit kind of stinging uh, brightness with a nice, again, tropical undertone. So when I combine Oxiana base with Paradisimide, I get this fresh, zingy, almost piercing tropical note. But it doesn't necessarily smell like anything tropical in itself. You, you, you identify these two materials combined as something tropical is going on, but you don't say, oh, I smell passion fruit, I smell pineapple, I smell this. You just smell tropical without identifying what the actual note is, which is why uh, we'll talk about the next material. So Oxiana base, I'm at roughly two parts per thousand. I did put in from Ferminich guava base. Now guava is definitely a very good you know, tropical note. And I've noticed with guava base, to me, it's very, 
it has a juicy quality to it. So when I had the paradisimide and the oxiana base, that took care of all the zesty, sharp, sulfuric kind of tropicalness. Guava base, however, doesn't have any of that. It's more, almost think lactonic, juicy, wet, uh, kind of guava juice. And that works perfectly. And it's very, very long lasting. At least in this fragrance composition, it's very long lasting, well beyond through the middle notes. And guava base, I've only got it at a little above one part per thousand. It's at uh, 0.15% of the concentrate. So it only takes a little bit to kind of take it there. And so that takes care of the tropical fruits, uh, which I'm calling the tropical fruit melange, basically. It gives the underlying tone of tropical fruitiness. Now, the next two tropical materials that I'm putting in here are two bases that I've made myself. One is a pre-made coconut base and the next one is a pre-made coconut base, or not coconut, uh, pineapple base. And when you combine coconut and pineapple together, what do you get? You get pina colada, basically. So, but I don't want this to be a strong pina colada fragrance. So I'm using more coconut, more so than I am pineapple. So my coconut accord is roughly six parts per thousand. And my pineapple base is at five parts per thousand. But the way that I built this pineapple base, it's more of a top note. It kind of fizzles out in the early stages. So you'll detect it in the opening stages. You know, you'll, you'll obviously smell the coconut and you'll get a hint of, oh, I smell pineapple. It's kind of got like this uh, pina colada thing going on. And then when you smell your fragrance again, like maybe 30 minutes later after wearing it, you don't get pina colada anymore. It's just pretty much coconut with the undertone of tropical fruits. And let's see. So now, moving on to the aquatic uh, materials. So again, beachy fragrance needs something aquatic, but I'm not going to go too heavy handed on it because I don't want it to smell like an aquatic fragrance. These are just leaning in just to give some ocean breeze, uh, just a, a little bit of wetness. And I tried so many different materials for you know, like Sentinel, Adoxyl, this one and that one. And I kept coming back to just standard old Calone. Calone just seems to work. And I'm going at one part per thousand. So it's nothing, you know, crazy. I've seen fragrances go as high as five parts per thousand. And then it becomes very identifiable. Like, oh, that's clearly an aquatic fragrance. This one, I'm just going one part per thousand because I just want hints of aquaticness just to help, uh, back up the mossiness, because to me, Calone has almost a saltiness to it, which can sometimes you find saltiness in oak moss. So the two combined just kind of complements each other in a beachy kind of way. So one part per thousand of the Calone, and I'm comboing it with uh, IFF makes something called Pinot Ace Aldehyde. And again, it's another ozonic beachy material to me. And again, this one is dosed just a little bit lower than Calone. It's roughly at 0.06%. So I wouldn't call it traces, but it's still under one part per thousand. And Pinot Ace Aldehyde to me is a different beast than Calone because Pinot Ace Aldehyde to me actually smells like ocean breezes, whereas Calone has this kind of aquatic uh, seawater kind of vibe. Pinot Ace Aldehyde doesn't smell like sea water. It smells like cold sea breeze air, but it has little facets and nuances of pine in the undertone. So I thought the pine uh, has a nice aromatic touch to combinate or combinate to combo with all the other woody materials. And then again, there's still some more, a couple more materials we'll talk about that why I chose Pinot Ace Aldehyde. Uh, but moving on, uh, now, I wanted to have some sort of aromaticness to it because uh, most, again, the fragrance, while intended to be unisex, I wanted it to ever so slightly dip masculine. A lot of uh, masculine fragrances are considered aromatic and aromatic could mean anything. It could be herbal. It could be just things that kind of jump off the skin. Uh, 
So what I chose to do was a material called Plicatone from Firminich. And I find this to be a very fascinating material because yes, it is very aromatic in small doses, but it also has nuances of like pine, juniper, cypress. So it's an aromatic in a sense where it's not herbal, it's aromatic in a woodsy way. And Plicatone is one of those materials that shocks me because when you smell it off a paper strip or a bottle, it's faint. But when you add it in a blend, it just explodes for some reason. And I love that. So Plicatone, I'm at three parts per thousand and I will not go any higher than three parts per thousand because it almost overtakes the top notes. Um, but again, because I chose uh, Plicatone, because I wanted something more aromatic to backtrack again, because we chose to do linalol acetate with sclerolate to give a nuanced uh, clary sage kind of feel, which is again, an aromatic material. When you combine it with Plicatone, it really makes it jump off the skin. And because Plicatone has those woody nuances of pine, juniper, and cypress, that's why I chose it to go with Pinot Ace Aldehyde, which is sea breeze and pine. So those two kind of play hand in hand when it when you want the, the sea breeze and the aromatics to kind of jump off the skin a little bit. So Plicatone, three parts per thousand. And the last of the materials is just some lemony zesty top notes. Um, let me see, I think I skipped one somewhere. Ah, I did skip one. Uh, before we go into the top notes of, of the, the citruses, I missed pink pepper. Um, for the earlier batches, I've been using, trying to experiment some other materials that help things jump off the skin in an aromatic way. I tried um, juniper berry CO2, I tried cypress essential oil, and those all did work. But I found when I use juniper berry, you know, CO2, cypress or pine, when you combine that with plicatone, it just screamed woodiness from the very top of the, you know, all the way through the base. And it was almost too woody for me. So, but then I was like, well, let me try something that still has a nice, clean, spicy facet. And I went with pink pepper CO2 and it was perfect. Uh, the earlier trial batches, I kind of dosed it a little bit too high. Version 22 that I'm on right now, I've got pink pepper CO2 uh, at three parts per thousand. And what I'm really digging about this is to me, pink pepper, if it's dosed low enough, you almost get a sparkling mineral quality, like brightness, almost not to say it's sandy, but it complements the salty nature of Calone and, you know, the salty nature of the, you know, so the low dose of uh, oak moss that you can sometimes get. So the pink pepper just kind of ever so slightly adds a subtle spiciness, but almost a mineral quality to it if it's dosed low enough. And what I also like about pink pepper is because I'm using rosy materials to simulate a frangipani flower accord, pink pepper and rose seamlessly go hand in hand in a lot of fragrances. So this was a smart choice for me to switch over to pink pepper. So pink pepper, CO2, three parts per thousand. Now moving on to the last bit, which is just the top note, the citrus accords. And I don't want this to be a super citrus heavy fragrance because I wanted the focus to be more on the tropical fruits in the woods and that coconut kind of creaminess feel. And so what I chose was just standard old Italian lemon oil, uh, a little bit of dehydromersinol, lemon oil, and then methyl pamplemousse. So, but I'm using them in a way because I don't want grapefruit. Um, so let me first tell you the lemon oil in this is roughly about 4.7% of the fragrance concentrate is just coming from lemon oil. And I'm using dehydromersinol at about one and a half percent in the concentrate. Because to me, again, I wanted that unisex fragrance to lean ever so slightly masculine. Dehydro, uh, dehydromersinol 
is used classically time and time again in a lot of men's fragrances as a staple top note. So I'm using just a little bit of it, only one and a half percent, because I, again, I wanted to lean it masculine without it actually coming off as now it's a masculine fragrance. I'm still within unisex territory with 4.7% lemon oil, one and a half percent dehydromersinol, and then I'm microdosing, uh, where are you, lemon oil. Uh, lemon oil is like a lemon nitrile, uh, I, I believe, and it's a very long lasting lemon material, but the only drawback is if you use it too much of it, it comes across as this bright, screechy lemon cleaner. Like when you smell Pledge or like lemon dish soaps or lemon cleaning solutions. I mean, to me, that's what lemon oil smells like. But if you use ever so slightly small amounts of it with regular uh, lemon essential oil, it just kind of slightly drags it out past the top into the mids ever so slightly. So my lemon oil though, I'm dosed pretty low. It's under one part per thousand. It's actually at 0.04%. So it's not really noticeable uh, in scent, but you'll notice after the first 30 minutes of wearing the fragrance that once the lemon essential oil is kind of fading pretty quickly, the lemon oil ever so slightly just drags it further into the mids before it goes completely to no lemon. And then of course, methyl pamplemousse, Everyone uses it as a grapefruit note, but here I'm not using it to portray a grapefruit note. I like it because it has a dry, sharp, kind of, not to say pithy and acidic, but it, all the qualities of grapefruit that you want a tartness, a, you know, a sharpness or tartness. I'm only using four parts per thousand of methyl pamplemousse just because I want to give a little bit more sharp tartness to the lemon. Uh, so when you dose methyl pamplemousse just ever so slightly lower, it doesn't come off as a grapefruit note, but it does enhance the lemon essential oil and lemon oil and give it just a little bit more brightness and sharpness and a little pithy, you know, bitterness to it as well. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's it. I pretty much went through all of these. And th again, this is at uh, trial batch number 22. And I'm probably going to go all the way up to trial batch 50. And at this stage, you know, I, I mixed a batch this morning. I've got it on my skin because I'm impatient, but I will wait uh, four or five days to let that batch mellow before I actually smell it and evaluate. And what I did notice, though, what I did differently with this batch versus uh, the previous one, which is version 21, I overdosed the pink pepper in version 21. So I took it, I, th I think I started off at five parts per thousand. And in this batch, I, I took it down to three parts per thousand because five parts per thousand, it just dominated, you know, that much pink pepper dominated the top notes and it kind of overshadowed all these other mini accords that were going on. And pink pepper CO2 is quite, you know, long lasting in my opinion. It goes into the mids pretty easily. So I wanted to lower that just to give a little bit of miner minerality and spiciness without it actually coming off as, hello, I'm pink pepper, here I am. Like, I don't want it in your face. And then I also, the in version 21, I had Liliol too high. I think I had it over 5% Liliol. And when I smelled the fragrance, once I got to the mids, that much Liliol was, again, overshadowing the frangipani accord. So in version 22, which we just talked about, uh, I dropped it down to, what I say, 4%? Yeah, 4%, which still may be too much. I don't know. I have to wait a few days and see how this batch turns out. But right now that the way it's sitting, it's the balance is there. The materials have been chosen. It's Now it's just going to be fine-tuning certain things and getting it to where I need it to be. And that's why it's probably going to go another 10, 20 trials, just kind of further tweaking things. So that's pretty much it. Uh, that was just something I wanted to discuss, like what goes on in my mind when choosing materials for a specific fragrance, whether if it's a brief or if you're making something for a friend, family, or yourself, uh, why I chose the materials, uh, why I dosed them in certain ways to play along or play nicely with other accords, other materials, so everything just kind of works cohesively to, at the end of the day, uh, you're, you have, you're just trying to paint a picture and 
you want to, your end result, uh, what's up in here, you want it to actually smell exactly what you envisioned. And that's, you know, kind of what I'm going with here. So again, that is version 22. I hope you guys had fun watching this and maybe uh, struck some ideas for you, uh, some different accords if you guys wanted to try them and things like that. So yeah, with that being said, until next time.